А, следующий. А, а, Анна Сузак, Львов, Украина. А, collective Memory of the Holocaust and Post Communist Львов. Yes? Okay. 15 минут. Ну, я тоже буду говорить на английском языке, но, конечно же, если будут вопросы, с удовольствием отвечу на русском. Uh, so the title of my presentation is uh, Lieu Dubli, Collective Non-Memory of the Holocaust in Post-Communist Lviv. Uh, the first uh, words might be not really familiar for people who don't deal with memory studies, but this concept is derived from Pierre Nora's notion of Lieu de Memoire, the places of memory, uh, which are uh, the places of crystallization of certain narratives about the past. But as many scholars argue, uh, memory is always a double process. It is always the dynamics of memory and forgetting. So Lieu Dubli means the places of forgetting. And I am going to look on precisely these dynamics of remembering and forgetting about the Holocaust on the example of the city of Lviv in uh, nowadays Western Ukraine. Uh, so, first of all, I don't go too deep into the debates on collective memory theories because this is a huge subject and huge topic. I should mention that my background is sociology. So what I'm going to talk about is a sociological perspective. Uh, but uh, my theoretical framework in, is Paul Connaughton's concept of uh, place memory, uh, which is a double notion because it means the urban landscape that remembers through its physical form, which has been shamed by people who live there and who created certain uh, memory places, and also the memory of dwellers, of the people who live uh, in this place, and who have different knowledge of the place's history, as well as personal memories connected to it. So uh, it is very often that collective memory is regarded in the frames of nation, of certain countries and nations. But I think it's very important to look also on the local variants of collective memory, because it gives us very interesting lens of looking uh, on different narratives local, official, personal, civic and international, and how they interact in the, on the example of one place. Uh, so, uh, sources and materials. Of course, different narratives on the past, both dominant and alternative, are inscribed and transferred into the public sphere through different media. It's mass media, it's internet, it's museums, libraries, archives. But I will concentrate on the three types of urban markers. It's monuments, uh, um, street names and memory tables, memory plaques. Why I've chosen these uh, three urban markers? Because they are mostly embodied into everyday practices of living the uh, city landscape and they are most open to the spontaneous encounter for both people who live in this city and for those who come there as, for example, as tourists. And uh, as when speaking about the memory of the inhabitants, I'll base my uh, conclusions on the results of statistical sociological logical survey, which has been conducted in 2008, and which is named Jewish Heritage in the Perception of the Inhabitants of Lviv. Of course, each of these methods and materials has its limitation, but for me it is very important to put together the uh, analysis of places of memory and how the people perceive uh, the representation of Jewish history and the Holocaust in the cityscape. Uh, so what is very important to start with is uh, the, ch the structure of population in the city. So here we see the graph, which shows us how this, the population changes in the 20th century. So uh, before the war, uh, the percentage of Polish population has been 50% and Jewish population 30%. But then we can see dramatic decrease. So the Jewish population was vanished in the Holocaust, while the Polish population has been deported in the 1950s, according to the Polish-Soviet uh, agreement. So uh, when we, the, Maria Levitska, famous Polish psychologist, coined this term, the cities of changed blood. So basically, when we have the architecture in the city which remained, but then we have completely different population. And it is not only the case of Lviv. Lviv is very often compared to such cities as Wroclaw or Kaliningrad or Vilnius. So when we speak about collective memory, this is def definitely the point what, where we have to start with. Uh, so uh, 
here we see the results of the survey which I've mentioned, and uh, as you can see, 41% of the respondents uh, have not been born in Lviv, so they are basically newcomers. And uh, when we speak about the Ukrainian character of the city, these are mainly the people who came to the city after the war to work in the factories, and this is very often the, the village population, so people who mig migrated to Lviv from villages. Uh, only 30% are first-generation Lvivians, so, so those who who have been born in the city, and the rest, uh, which is less than 30%, are the people who, whose parents or grandparents have been born in the city. Uh, so, when we speak about the representation of Jewish history in Lviv, uh, first of all, it was also striking for me uh, to compare Lviv with Riga, because yesterday we heard that in Riga, before the war, there have been 40 synagogues, just like in Lviv. And uh, after the war, there has been only two. And uh, of course, they weren't used as synagogues during the Soviet times, and they were open only in the 90s. Uh, so we can speak about not only about the Holocaust of Jewish population, but also about the urbicide of Jewish Lviv, so vanishing and erasing the traces of Jewish presence in the city. Uh, as we mentioned already several times uh, these days, the Holocaust has been a challenge to uh, official uh, myth of World War II, where could there could have been only one victim, Soviet people. So it, it was also a forbidden topic in the, uh, in the Soviet times. And here we see the example of Yanovska concentration camp, which has been the major Holocaust site in the city, and uh, which has been used as a prison during Soviet times, and no markers uh, showed that this, this was a really uh, awful and horrible place during the war. Uh, and uh, it's still a very, very problematic memory scape, but there are projects of commemorating uh, the, the concentration camp, and also uh, the organization I work in, the Center for Urban History, are working in this direction. Uh, it's important to mention that uh, Lviv City Council is also actively participating in this in these processes. So when it comes to uh, the alternative discourses, the memory which has been uh, transferred from generation to generation, as we mentioned before, because of these huge changes in the population structure, the sources were really limited. So uh, the people couldn't really rely on what their, uh, their grandparents told them about the, the city, because they didn't really live there before the war. Uh, when, we, when it comes to local memory politics in post-Soviet context, it's very important to say that uh, after 1991, the city has undergone the radical recodification of the uh, landscape. So uh, basically 300 sit, uh, street names have, have been changed and all the Soviet monuments were destroyed. And uh, uh, the Lviv, it's, it's quite a popular thought among the scholars that it has been uh, promoted as the center of Ukrainian national building. So uh, may, maybe the most symbolical in this sense is the monument to Bandera, which was mentioned today several times. Uh, so uh, this radical uh, notion of Ukrainian nationalism uh, has been mostly promoted in Western Ukraine and in Lviv. Uh, so uh, a lot of scholars talk about the uh, sort of inheritance be be between Soviet and post-Soviet models of uh, uh, city memory uh, because of the gaps. So uh, some uh, scholars see that just Soviet gaps have been replaced with nationalist gaps. But uh, it's not really uh, true because we have to speak about the role of public sphere and the pluralization narratives. Uh, uh, so one of the uh, main counter narrative is the image of the city as a multicultural cultural one. Uh, here you see the uh, logo of city which has been created in 2006 and which shows the towers of different uh, churches of different confes uh, confessions. So basically these are two main uh, projects and two main narratives and of course the last project has been very much uh, promoted by tourism and by co co commercialization of the city pass. Because of course when tourists come to the city they are much more interested in seeing all the different cultures and not only the, the Ukrainian uh, nationalist narrative. Uh, but uh, when, it, when it comes to uh, the 
politics of memory in, in Ukraine, uh, what we always have to remember is the divided memory and uh, different narratives which, are, which exist in different regions of Ukraine. Uh, it's a very complex topic and I, we could talk about it for, for hours and hours, but I'll just show one small illustration, which is the geography of Lenin monuments in Ukraine. So in red, it's marked the regions where they are in a large number. Yellow is former Galicia, so Lviv, Ternopil, and ivano frankivsk region, when they are basically absent. And in blue, there are regions where there is a few of monuments. And with the monuments of, to Bandera, it's the opposite situation. There are a lot of monuments to Bandera in uh, former Galicia, in these three yellow provinces. There are projects to uh, put monuments in these blue regions, but there are no Bandera monuments in the regions which are marked red. So when one says about Ukrainian memory politics, one have also always has to remember about this background. Uh, so uh, when it comes to commemoration of Holocaust after 1991, uh, it, th this monument, the monument to the victims of Lviv Ghetto, appeared uh, right after the proclamation of independence. So basically, the remembrance of Holocaust has been possible after, after the fall of, 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 fall of communism. And uh, it's important to mention that uh, this monument was supported also very much by uh, Ukrainian intelligentsia by former dissidents. So it was established in close cooperation. Um, and uh, another big group of uh, memory places uh, which appeared in Lviv after the war. As I said, a lot of synagogues were destroyed. So um, here we see the example of a temple reformist synagogue, uh, on place of which a memory plaque has been put. But when you read the inscription on this memory plaque, you can see that only the moment of building and the moment of destruction is emphasized. And basically, we do not see any image of this uh, synagogue. We, uh, average, uh, pass, uh, average uh, person who sees this, uh, this memory plaque doesn't really, cannot know how, it, uh, how this place looked before. So uh, in my opinion, such type of commemoration is rather commemorating the Holocaust, because we just see the moment and the event how this uh, synagogue was destroyed. Uh, so when we uh, speak about the markers of Jewish history in Lviv after 1991, there are not too many, but uh, we see that most of them are memory plaques, and precisely the accent is made on the events of Holocaust. Of course, not all the places connected to the destruction of Lviv Jews are marked, but uh, the most forgotten part remains the Jewish history in Lviv before the Second World War. So there are only two markers that somehow refer to it. Uh, of course, there are a number of civic initiatives. I could speak about each of them uh, for a long uh, time. And uh, uh, what has to be emphasized is also the influence of different international projects and international discourses. For example, Agnieszka Holland's movie, I don't know if you saw it, it's called In the Darkness. It's about the group of Jews which has been hidden in Lviv in the uh, canalization, in the channels for during the war. And uh, this, uh, this story has been not known in the city until her movie, even though the books and the m memories uh, existed for a long time. So sometimes it's really very much an external influence which fosters the debates uh, in the city. Uh, so, but of course then, so we can speak about partial inclusion of the Holocaust narrative in the uh, memory politics of Lviv after the war, but it is very much contested uh, because of the debates around the role of uh, Ukrainian nationalists and auxiliary police in the Holocaust. So that's what makes the subject uncomfortable for ma many people. And, uh, but the debates around this problematic past is held mostly in academic circles and also with the very active participation of Western historians and the Ukrainian historians who have been uh, trained in West. And uh, it didn't really go beyond uh, these academic circles. The most prominent public debate uh, happened only recently after uh, John Paul Himka's article on the Lviv pogrom of 1941 was published in a very famous internet resource, Historyczna Pravda, Historian True. So it gathered almost thousands of comments and uh, uh, the response has been written by uh, the group of 
uh, not really scholars, more amateurs, who were trying to, um, to counterpoint his view. But uh, yeah, but this was basically one of the biggest public debates on this topic recently. And yes, the role of internet becomes really important and might, may change the situation. So uh, sometimes I have a feeling that Ukraine or Lviv awaits its Jan Gross, maybe. So we can say that uh, John Paul Himka somehow uh, tries uh, or starts to play a similar role, fostering the debates on the Holocaust in view. Uh, of course, there is the narrative of competitive victimhood. And uh, um, here we can see the citation from uh, the uh, website of Lonsky Prison, uh, which says about the suffering of the Jews. But the next uh, sentence is that Ukrainians suffered no less. So uh, Harald Welzer speaks about this substitution of reference frames when raising the subject of Shoah becomes the motif to speak by analogy about the suffering of own group. And uh, yes, and of course, again, this divided memory and very much the politicization of suffering and of the uh, suffering of different groups. Uh, for example, um, recently uh, the, the politician of Party of Region, Vadim Kolesnichenko, has published a book uh, with the articles by the scholars who actually study the participation of Ukrainian nationalists in the Holocaust, but he published it without their permission. So basically, he was fostering his agenda and his uh, view uh, by instrumentalizing, politicizing, and using their work without any permission. And such problems and such tendencies, of course, don't help the debates to become really public and really uh, wide. Uh, so I'll, I'll quickly go through the results of the survey because I, I thought it's really important to give the background. So basically, when it comes to uh, the, the question was, was posed about the events that played most negative role in the history of Ukraine and Lviv. Uh, as, as I mentioned, the sample was only the inhabitants of Lviv. So here we speak about the local, uh, local collective memory. And uh, we can say that uh, the, sec the, the Holocaust has not been mentioned almost. It's, it's, it's been mentioned only uh, by two or three people it's really not there. But the Second World War is, uh, of course, one of the most traumatic events in, in the view of, of inhabitants, both for the city and for Ukraine. So the subject of the perception of Second World War and how Holocaust is perceived in its context is still very much not studied, and it has to be studied further. But uh, of course, uh, we can say that on the first two positions, there are uh, the events connected to, to Soviet times. Um, uh, when it comes to the sources of information about the uh, history of Jewish Lviv, we asked where people take and would like to take the information about the subject. Uh, the, the leading role is uh, by, um, by mass media. But also it's very important to say that almost 40% of respondents declared the lack of interest in this subject. So they say that they are not basically interested to learn more about this. Uh, and uh, another question was reason about how the estimation of percentage of Jews among the population in Lviv before the war, right after the war, and today. And non-response rate to this question was 52%. Basically, more than half of the respondents refused to answer it, which in sociological terms means that, first of all, lack of cultural competence. So people simply don't know anything about the subject. And second, lack of, lack of interest in it. So it's not really in the realm of their interest. Uh, but when it comes to uh, the results, the green line are official statistics, and the, the yellow one is uh, the estimated by, uh, by people. People tend to underestimate the percentage of population before the war and very much overestimate uh, the after the war and today's population. And uh, when it comes to the difference be between estimating after and pre-war population, which basically means uh, if the respondents understand the, the uh, scale of losses, it's uh, two times less than official statistics. So uh, of course, people really uh, underestimate the, 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 the scale of losses of Jewish community during the Holocaust. Um, when it comes to the awareness, I'm sorry that the diagrams are in, in Ukrainian. Uh, so. 
uh, more than half, uh, around half of uh, respondents uh, told that they think there were no pogroms in Lviv during the 20th century. And uh, around more than around 40% of the population don't know nothing or don't think that there has been a ghetto, Jewish ghetto in Lviv uh, during the war. So, uh, and even with the positive responses, we have to say that it's only declared awareness. The question was posed in a way that sort of hints people that yes, probably something like this was there. So we don't really know that this percentage is, is, uh, is true. So we, we really speak here only about the declared awareness. Uh, yeah, and uh, another important question was posed about uh, a, a number of initiatives which were proposed to people uh, concerning the development of Jewish heritage in the city. And uh, we can say that the most supported initiatives were uh, the exhibition about Jewish past, so it's around 61% of respondents who supported it. And on the second place, we see the Museum of the Holocaust. So, but both people list support is renaming the streets after, uh, after the, 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 the famous uh, Lvivians of Jewish origin. Uh, so we can say that there is certain barrier of letting this narrative into the public space of the city. Uh, and uh, even more interesting is the question of financing. So of course such initiatives should be supported by someone. And as we can see, most of people think that these initiatives should be supported only by the members of Jewish community itself. And only the Museum of Holocaust, according to respondents, uh, could have more uh, budget financing. So basically people tend to put responsibility for the development of this heritage on uh, the, the representatives of Jewish community itself. Uh, so, just going to the conclusions quickly, uh, as we can see, many inhabitants of Lviv declare the lack of interest in Jewish history and tend to underestimate both their presence in the city before the war and scale of losses during the Holocaust. And Jewish heritage is perceived as alien and the realm of responsibility is put on small Jewish community. But what is very important, uh, I analyzed this in my article, but I didn't talk about it for long here, that the factors of age, education, identity, and also native language have a strong influence in this case. So younger people, as well as older people, uh, tend to be more interested in the Jewish past and uh, have higher awareness on the events of Holocaust. Uh, also, the people with higher education and those who identify themselves with the region or the city. So the ones who've chosen the identity of Lvivian or the inhabitant of Western Ukraine tend to show higher awareness and more interest than those who have chosen the identity of Ukrainian or a citizen of Ukraine. So basically the place attachment and attachment to your region has really strong influence in this case. And what is also interesting that the Russian speaking population of Lviv has also shown more interest and more awareness on the subject. It might be that here the sort of minority uh, uh, factor has played the role. So of course the representatives of minorities would be much more open to the multicultural narrative, even though the Russians in Lviv basically appeared after the uh, Second World War. So it's not that they uh, relate too much to the pre-war city. So uh, it's just two. Two, two brief points. Yeah. Uh, discussions on the Holocaust are limited mostly to academic circle, and the mar marginalization of the subject is connected uh, to the role of own uh, and other nationalistic forms uh, in the Holocaust. Uh, and um, um, so, uh, of course, a huge role has been played by the NGOs and the academic community. But what I want to emphasize is that as we see the events of Shoah, even though they are not fully commemorated, but they remain the most commemorated part of Jewish history in Lviv. Uh, and it's also somehow the, uh, the initiatives that people would be most eager to support. But we have to ask ourselves the questions. Uh, will the inhabitants of Lviv be able to embrace fully the scale of losses and tragedy of Jewish community during the Holocaust without proper understanding of the role that Jews played here before the war? So what is very important is not to, uh, to concentrate and not to forget about uh, this uh, pre-war history. And I think that commemorating this part of Jewish 
uh, role in the city really will somehow influence the people's perception. Thank you for your attention, and I don't know if we have time for comments, but yeah. yeah. I think, uh, thank you so much. But давайте оставим время, потом запоминайте все вопросы, зато вы не уйдете.